up on this Tuesday edition of Daybreak. South Korea and China reaffirm their commitment to deter North Korea from its nuclear ambitions. Authorities are closing in on Yu byung an the de facto owner of the sunken Sewol Ho ferry. Police are holding a woman who was with the elusive businessman up until this past weekend. Plus, Ukrainian forces launch airstrikes against pro-Russian rebels who seized an airport in the country's east. Ukraine's new president vows to talk to Russia to end the crisis. Daybreak begins now. Hello and thanks for joining us to our viewers around the world. It's 6 a.m. on Tuesday, May 27th here in Seoul. I'm Mark Broom and you're tuned in to Daybreak. Our top story this morning, South Korea and China have reaffirmed their joint commitment to stop North Korea going ahead with another nuclear test. Meeting in Seoul on Monday, the two countries' foreign ministers said that dialogue is key to resolving issues with Pyongyang. Hwang sung -hee reports. Amid renewed threats of a fourth nuclear test, South Korea and China said a nuclear-armed North Korea will not be tolerated. Following two hours of talks in Seoul on Monday, South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi agreed on the need to resume dialogue with Pyongyang. This for tangible progress in North Korea's denuclearization and to prevent further development of its nuclear capacity. Yoon said Monday's talks will send a clear message to Pyongyang. I believe Minister Wang's visit will be an opportunity to reaffirm our shared views on intolerance on North Korea's nuclear program and peace and security on the Korean Peninsula and to send a clear message to the North. China, North Korea's closest ally, has called for a swift resumption of the long-stalled six-party denuclearization talks involving the two Koreas, China, the United States, Japan and Russia. But Beijing is growing more frustrated with Pyongyang as it continues to issue threats and launch provocations. The visiting Chinese diplomat expressed hopes to work even more closely with South Korea. China would like to choose South Korea as a more intimate cooperative partner in response to serious changes in regional and international circumstances. The two sides also discussed details of Chinese President Xi Jinping's state visit to South Korea, which may take place as early as next month. Wang also met with President Park Geun-hye to offer his condolences over the tragic Seoro ferry sinking. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. And during her meeting with the Chinese Foreign Minister, President Park said Pyongyang should stop threatening a new form of nuclear test and discontinue operations and its main nuclear facilities if it's serious about engaging in dialogue. She also expressed gratitude for China's support for her policy of trust building with North Korea. She said she would hold deeper discussions on resolving the North Korean nuclear problem with Chinese President Xi Jinping when he comes to Seoul next month. Now, North Korea's chief delegate to the six-party talks, Lee Yong-ho, is confirmed to have met with former U.S. government officials in Mongolia. Seoul based Yonhap News reports Lee met with former U.S. State Department official Joel Witt, as well as ex-CIA analyst Robert Carlin. Washington says the two, if they indeed made contact, were acting in their own capacity and that the U.S. government has a separate channel of communications with Pyongyang. The U.S. also made clear its message to North Korea remains the same, that Pyongyang needs to show a sincere attitude about giving up its nuclear ambitions. When asked about the matter, China's foreign ministry spokesperson, Chin Gang, told reporters he wasn't aware of the meeting. President Park's reform-minded Prime Minister nominee, An Dae-hee, has tried to cool down the controversy over his income at a press conference Monday and pledged to give back to society about one million US dollars he earned as a lawyer over suspicions his sudden jump in earnings was the result of his previous post as a Supreme Court judge. He said he decided to return the money because he believes his income shouldn't get in the way of fulfilling his promise to set social discipline and eradicate corruption. 
as the country's next prime minister, adding that he would reform himself first. Anne's nomination will be confirmed following a parliamentary hearing. And more on the topic of reform, President Park Geun-hye says fixing public enterprises will be the basis for building a well-founded economy and a starting point to earn public trust. Speaking to the heads of local public entities on Monday, the president promised to correct irregularities in the public sector and enhance the quality of their services. In regards to the public sector's heavy debt and lax management, she said their capabilities and efficient management directly affect the country's productivity and global competitiveness. In order to address this, she asked attendees to make voluntary reforms to root out unfair trade practices, create transparency among public enterprises, increase productivity and raise awareness about public safety. Now, there are just, there's just over a week to go until local elections here in Korea and more and more voters appear to be turning their backs on Korea's two biggest political parties and towards independent candidates. Ji Myung-gil shows us how much influence these voters will have come June 4th. The closer we draw to election day, the more apparent it becomes that voters are leaning toward independent candidates, especially in the city of Busan, a conservative stronghold, and Gwangju, the traditional home ground of liberals. Of all voters on election day, nearly 44 percent are undecided about who they will vote for, according to a survey conducted by Embrain. And of that total, more than half of the respondents said they will vote for independent candidates. This holds extra meaning in the cities of Busan and Gwangju. In the ruling Saenuri Party's home turf of Busan, polls show independent candidate Oh go Don up by nearly four percentage points over the ruling party's Ho byung Su in the race for the mayor. Oh's popularity saw a boost after a candidacy merger on May 16th with Kim Young-chun of the main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy in an effort to unite liberal votes. Over in the race for mayor of Gwangju, right in the middle of the main opposition's home ground, the liberal candidate Yoon Jang-hyun finds himself trailing behind independent candidate Kang Eun-tae. The polls show that Kang's polling numbers are double those of Yoon's. Kang withdrew from the main opposition party to run as an independent in protest of party's co-leader An Chol Su's influence in the nomination of Yoon. According to the National Election Commission on Monday, some 2.4 million more people will be able to vote in these local elections, up 6.3 percent from the last ones in 2010. The increase was attributed to the aging and growth of Korea's overall population. Kim Young-gil, Arirang News. Staying with politics and lawmakers will elect the new speaker and vice speakers for the latter part of the 19th National Assembly today. It's customary for only one candidate from the ruling party to be nominated for the speaker position in the Korean parliament. And as five-term lawmaker Jong Yi Hwa has already been chosen through an inner party election in the ruling Senate party, he will most likely become the new leader of the parliament. As for one of the vice speakers, the ruling party has tapped four-term lawmaker Jong gap -yun. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy has yet to decide on who will fill the other vice speaker position. We start before the sun rises to bring you the latest stories out of Korea. We also lead the way with important global coverage. Stay on the pulse of what is happening with Daybreak. Now, Korea's number one mobile messenger service provider, Kakao, is merging with the country's number two web portal, Daom, in a multi-billion dollar deal. This is the largest merger involving internet-based companies in Korea and could pose a threat to Korea's biggest search engine, Naver. Kim ji reports. Korea's largest mobile messaging service, Kakao Corporation, has agreed to merge with internet company Town Communications Corporation. When the deal is complete, Kakao will have more than 60 percent of the equity in the merged company dubbed Town Kakao and will be valued up to 3.9 billion U.S. dollars. 
The heads of the two companies expect the deal to create a synergy effect as they compete with the country's largest internet portal, Naver Corporation, and its mobile messaging service line. Taum CEO Choi Seun said Kakao's strong competitiveness in the mobile sector, combined with Taum's contents, will help the company compete in the fast changing market. But some analysts are skeptical that the marriage will help the company enter the global market. Kakao is seeking ways to enter the global market just like Naver did through its line service to survive the competition. With this in mind, Kakao is wasting its time and resources through this merger with Taum, which is a local market driven company. The unlisted Kakao, which has more than 130 million users, is estimated to be worth $2.3 billion. Taum, which is currently listed on the tech heavy cost stack, is valued at more than $1 billion. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Now, longer lifespans coupled with a frozen retirement age have Koreans spending less on their day to day basis than they did 10 years ago, all to make sure they have enough saved up for their golden years. A survey by the Korea Development Institute shows that the average spending index dropped for all age groups in the 10-year span ending, ending uh, 2013. But in particular, those reaching retirement age were the most likely to skimp on their daily expenditures as they plan for life post-retirement. The Institute says the government should come up with measures to extend the retirement age and also reduce the cost of private education as it takes up a large chunk of household expenditures for families with school-aged children. Korea's finance minister is calling on the government and the private sector to work hand in hand to speed up the pace of the economic recovery. Hyun Oh-sok made the remarks Monday at a meeting with other policymakers where he also asked businesses to advance investments. He said that while domestic consumption is picking up after the Sewolho ferry disaster, stronger momentum is needed, is critical. Private spending plunged last month in the wake of the ferry sinking. Minister Hyun went on to say that the government will continue to cut red tape to boost job creation and investment. Turning now to the investigation into the Sewolho ferry disaster, authorities say they are very close to finding the fugitive owner of the ferry operator, Yu byung An. Prosecutors believe he is somewhere in Korea's southern Jolanamdo province. Our Connie Lee has the details. It was at this rest stop where one of Korea's most wanted men was last seen. Prosecutors have confirmed that Yi byung un the de facto owner of the sunken Seodo ferry, was here in the city of Suncheon, about 400 kilometers south of Seoul, up until a few days ago. The married owners of a restaurant and guest house here have been detained on suspicion of helping you evade arrest. Police have also arrested at least three others for hindering the hunt for you. We say all those in custody are members of the Salvation Sect, which is a religious cult led by the ferry owner. With the latest developments, authorities now believe they were very close to finding you. They say he's no longer in Suncheon, but they do believe he's still hiding out somewhere in southern Korea because his children and several members of his cult are known to own land and businesses there. In the meantime, prosecutors have dramatically increased the cash reward for anyone with information on Yu's whereabouts. Officials have upped their bounty from 50,000 to 500,000 U.S. dollars, which is the highest amount Korean authorities have ever offered in such a case. The cash reward for information on his eldest son, Yu Dae-gyun, has also gone up from 30,000 to nearly $100,000. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, in the latest development, police have arrested another member of the religious cult, this time a woman in her 30s who was with Yu byung un when he slipped out of his compound last week. The female, who's been identified by her family named Shin, is believed to have been with Yu as recently as this past weekend. She's currently being questioned about Yu's current whereabouts. Now, on a lighter note, Buddhist temples in Korea have been opening themselves up to foreigners and visitors for years now, about 12 years in fact, to give them a sense of what it's like to live as a monk. Our Park Ji Won walks us through the latest additions, the updates to the Temple Stay program. 
since the Temple Stay program was first introduced in 2002. It's become one of Korea's most representative cultural programs, especially for foreign tourists who want a unique experience during their time here. With the popularity of the program rising, the number of people participating in the Temple Stay program has increased about seven times over during the past 12 years. And to meet the new demands of people living in this ever-changing society, the Joge Order, the largest Buddhism sect in Korea, has revamped its Temple Stay program. A total of 13 pilot temples around the country will launch the new program starting next month. They will focus on tapping into four themes, consolation, health, emptiness, and vision, and are composed of diverse new routines from walking meditation under the moon and music therapy to mountain climbing and yoga, each according to its theme. However, other key routines that have been staples of the Temple Stay program, like Zen meditation, eating the meals a monk might, and tea ceremonies, will remain unchanged. Temple Stay program started when Korean hosted the World Cup in 2002. Many people have found comfort and happiness at temples. We are now trying to make the program more systematic based on the four new themes. The Joge Order has also launched a new line of stationary products, inspired by the hundreds of traditional Korean patterns found on temples. Park ji Arirang News. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following at this hour. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Center. Good morning, Eunice. And good morning to you, Mark. Kiev is coming down hard on pro-Moscow rebels in eastern Ukraine, where hundreds of armed fighters are engaged in a fight with Kiev's forces. Reports say the insurgents arrived in the early morning hours at the major airport in Donetsk, and all flights were canceled. Gunfire broke out as at least one Ukrainian fighter jet flew overhead, and explosions were were heard in the direction of the airport. It isn't clear at this point who is in control there. President-elect Petro Poroshenko said he would not negotiate with the rebels, underlining that the anti-terrorist operation should not last more than a few months. He said Monday he wants to begin talks with Moscow to end the insurgency. Thailand's monarchy has officially endorsed the nation's military to run the country after it staged a coup d'etat last week. Despite relinquishing much of his powers in the 1930s, the Thai king still holds considerable influence over public opinion, where the monarchy remains the most important institution. Thai Army Chief Prayut Chan Ocha announced on Monday that the king appointed him the head of a military council to run the country, which he claims legitimizes last week's military coup. He also issued a fresh warning against those opposing the coup. Speaking to reporters in the capital of Bangkok, Prayut said that he intends to hold elections as soon as possible, but gave no time frame for a vote. He also added that the army would have no choice but to use force if protests flared up again. And India's new leader, Narendra Modi, was inaugurated in an elaborate historic ceremony on Monday, attended by all heads of state of South Asia, including that of India's traditional arch-rival, Pakistan. Modi became India's 15th prime minister with an outright majority in parliament, a first in New Delhi for the past 30 years, allowing the leader to sideline the Congress party and other opponents without a coalition with other regional parties. Politicos will be watching whether the 63-year-old former provincial chief will favor hardline nationalist policies over critical economic reforms. And a deal to release the kidnapped Nigerian schoolgirls was nearly secured until the Nigerian government called it off at the last minute. This is what the BBC reports. They say officials held talks with members of Boko Haram earlier this month at a location in northeast Nigeria where the girls were being held. The deal would have freed some of the girls in exchange for the release of 100 jailed Boko Haram members. It isn't clear why the deal went south.
And a good Tuesday morning to you all as we kick things off in the LPGA, where despite Poggin B missing the cut over the weekend at the Airbus LPGA Classic, she was still able to hold on to her number one ranking. And while Stacey Lewis did a great job in the four day event, she eventually dropped down tied for 10th place, which is good enough for Poggin B to hold on to her top spot for another week. This is all thanks to Jessica Corda, who stormed through the event, shooting a 20 under overall to claim the title. Meanwhile, Michelle Wee has been really impressive as of late as she came close to the title, finishing tied for third place after shooting an 18 under overall. And now moving over to the KBO, where the league took the day off as usual on Monday. But people are still talking about how great the Samsung Lions looked this season, despite losing some key players this offseason. And while the Samsung Lions lost players like Oh Sung Hwan, the late addition of Im Chang Yong has been great for the team, but really their offense, which has been incredible during their 11-game win streak, including their 18-2 win over the Nexon Heroes on Sunday. They've also scored an incredible 93 runs in their 11-game win streak, thanks to guys like Park Sang-min and Choi young -woo. And now moving over to volleyball, where the Korean Volleyball Association announced the roster for the men's and women's national volleyball team in preparations for the upcoming Incheon Asian Games. Now, first off, over on the men's side, the team will be led by their all-star setter Han Sun Su of the Korean Air Jumbos, who will be a crucial part of the team, while regulars like Kim Yo Han and Park Cho Ru were added as well. But the roster also includes last season's Rookie of the Year Chung Gwang In, who hopes to add to the offense. Meanwhile, the women's national team looks amazing at the moment as world-class volleyball star Kim Young Kyung of Fenerbahce will lead the way. Of course, the women's team also includes veterans who have years of experience on the national team, including Pang Yeon Ju and Han Song Yi. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs. Good morning. Well, the hot and sunny weather continues in full swing today. And right now we are waking up to mostly sunny skies and afternoon will be sunny and warm with temperatures in the upper 20s to low 30s across the areas. But the western parts of the region, including here in Seoul, have to deal with relatively high level of toxic dust in the morning hours. But that should gradually clear up as the day goes on. And again, the the entire nation can expect to see the full sun throughout the day. Well, over in Chindo, at the site of the ferry accident, winds should be blowing at 6 to 11 meters per second, so the winds will get stronger in the afternoon, and waves should be 1.5 meters high at their highest. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The low in Seoul is starting out at 16, and the high will rise to 28, while deg tops out at 33. Three and Gwangju and Busan should climb to 29 and 26 later on. Well, for other regions, it looks like down on Jeju and Dokdo should see a high of 27. Daejeon will reach 30, while Mount Kengang tops out at 19. Well, that's all for Korea, and here's the global forecast for viewers around the world.
Okay, well, those are the stories we have for you at this hour. Korea Today is coming up in about half an hour's time. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Until then, goodbye.